You know, one of the things that is really good to think about, um, you know, poor Saul, he, he lost out on everything because he just couldn't handle the pressure. It was really, he just couldn't handle the pressure. It's really what it came down to. If you look at every, really at every event um, in Saul's life, it was either he couldn't handle the pressure of the situation that he was under, he couldn't handle the pressure of the kind of, 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 of you know, responsibility, admiration he was getting. It just, 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 it just overwhelmed him. And I think one of the things that stand out to me that's a, a constant reminder of just you, you're going to have to get still and wait on God is how Saul lost out really big when he stepped outside of what God anointed him to do. God gave him the anointing to be king. Motivated by other, you know, uh, problems and pressures. And what's going on is Saul is on ready to go up against an army so much more powerful than him, okay? And the Philistines are, I mean, they're screaming, they're shouting, they're beating their shields with their swords. I mean, it's just a roar. They're, they're advancing, they're edging towards the position of Israel. And then make things worse, the people Israelites that he's got for a ragtag army are really getting discouraged and they're starting to they're starting to to leave. Um, you know, they're just they some of them are running away, some of them are walking away, some of them just talking about it. Okay. That is amazing pressure. And Samuel's late. We're, we're on earth to Samuel. Because he's got to offer the sacrifice before this thing's ever going to get started. If the sacrifice isn't offered, if worship doesn't take place, Father's not fighting with us. We're on our own. And so he's pacing back and forth. When have you been under pressure like that? Think about it. Because really, none of us can even begin to relate to this. None of us have ever had that kind of pressure where our life's being threatened the nation's life's being threatened. All the people's life's being threatened. You got the responsibility to do this. God put it on your shoulders. You kink. I mean, no one's ever been under that pressure that I know of. And it's easy to sit back and look at Paul, Saul and go, oh, man, you blew it, buddy. I can't even believe him. Why on earth, you know? And, um, but yet we can, we can actually do the same thing with less pressures with less issues to do with finances is a huge one. Um, having to make a decision because for this reason, for that reason, somebody's putting pressure on you, circumstance putting pressure on you. You've got to stop. You can't do nothing. You, you cannot do anything without the direction of the Lord. Saul stepped out. He said, well, you know what? I can offer this sacrifice. No, you can't. You don't have the anointing. You don't have the right. You're stepping outside of the place of authority. Because what happens is, and I've watched people do this over and again, not only in the home, husband, wife relationships, but also in the church. I've seen it happen in the workplace where people step outside of their authority, outside of their area, their responsibility, start doing something and just blow it. You mess it all up. And so, um, you know, understand that the Lord's never late. Father was completely aware of the fact that Samuel was late. Samuel was completely aware of the fact that he was late. He wasn't missing it. He was always on time. He was never late. Samuel was always on time. It's the Lord has the right to try your heart. See if you're going to really trust him and do it on your own. Because out of sight, out of mind. And we have to be careful with that. We're going to have to put the Lord's word, we're going to put God's word before us always. We must put it always before us. His word must always be before us. If, it, if his word isn't before us, 
we are going to do it wrong. Good thing is he's long suffering, he's patient, he's merciful. But the more you do it wrong, the more likely you are going to continue to do it wrong. So every day you're sowing into what you're going to be tomorrow, what you're going to be next year, what you're going to be years from now. So we've got to just understand some basic principle. Always put the Lord, always put the, his word before you. Keep it on your right hand and your left hand. Bind it upon tables of your heart. Write it upon, you know, your, your, your forehead, your fingers. You attach it to everything that's around you. Your, the post going into your door. The doorway going into your house. Speak of it continually. Meditate on these things. Don't let this word of this covenant depart out of your mouth. This is God's this is God's commandment for us. I'm going to talk to you tonight about being priest of the home, being priest and leader of the home. And women, you got to get this because if the order isn't right, you're going to get nothing. If you go to if you go to a church that Saul is pastoring, demon possessed Paul, Saul is pastoring. It's pretty dry. In fact, it's worse than dry. It's tormentous. OK. Because the anointing that is present comes through the ministry. God anoints the ministry. Okay? God anoints the king. God anoints the prophet. God anoints the priest. God anoints the apostle. He anoints the pastor. He anoints the evangelist, the prophet, the teacher. And God anoints the man of the home. He anoints the person that he's put into position to be the leader, to set this thing straight. Look, I'm telling you, as a priest, the priest represents God to the people. God in the house, and, and you've got to understand this. I, look, I'm not speaking on, in, in any kind of a fringe way here. I'm not speaking outside of the context of the majority of the voice in the church. The man of the home is God to the home. The head of Christ Jesus is the Father. The head of the man is Christ Jesus. The head of the woman is the man. That is an uninterrupted flow. And as a priest now, that takes it to another level because that's exactly what the priest did. He represented the people to God and he came out and represented God to the people. Fundamental to being priest of the home is that concept, is that responsibility. Now, a whole lot goes on with that responsibility. Number one, first and foremost, you consecrated as God's man in the home to be that. He consecrated. In other words, if you want to know the will of God for your life, he set you apart to be that, to represent your family to him. Now, that's a lot. of. I, I'm going to go into that tonight. I'm going to talk about the prayer. I'm going to talk about the sacrifice. I'm going to talk about the intercession. I'm going to tr talk about the petitioning. I'm going to talk about all the dimensions of responsibility for right and godly and holy living. I'm going to just briefly touch on things like the application of Matthew 12, uh, what is it, 29 or, or 30, <clears throat> excuse me, that unless you bind a strong man, you can't spoil his house. And there's two ways to look at that. It's us binding, it's binding Satan to spoil his house, but it's also b Satan binding the strong man of the authority of the house and spoiling the house that you and I are governor over, ruler over, priest over, prophet over. Because you could actually say, you could actually say that it, as we, we're going to, we're following Jesus in this. We do husbands to love their wives as Christ loved the church, okay? We're supposed to love our wives as our own body. Always, once again, that's Jesus talking about how he loves the church because church is his body. That's the context here. And we understand the role of Jesus is not just priest. He's also king. He's also prophet. Okay. He's also pastor. He's also teacher. He's also mentor. We could go through a whole long list of things. But what we want to do is we want to focus on the, the, those fundamental attributes, especially of the priestly duties and the priestly ministry. And um, so I, I'm going to take you through this outline and, and I'm going to be hitting on things like, you know, dear people, men, this is, I started off talking, making a quote from a, 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 a popular feminist, a, a militant feminist, who described that our culture will not allow men to be men and they are emas emasculated at a very early age. And 
reality of it is our culture won't allow men to be men. They're bumbling idiots that don't even know how to pour a glass of water from a pitcher. Watch what they say on, 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 the, on TV. All the sitcoms, oh, that's all really funny. Make the man look like an idiot. It is a, make the man is a bumbling idiot. He's so stupid, it's a wonder that he is allowed to keep his job. He's a drooling idiot that he's got to be shoved out the door and told everything to do, and he's going to forget his list unless he's got a tape recorder to remind him or something. No, that is, that is a, we make it funny, we laugh about it. It is a strategy of Satan to take away leadership and take away authority, to completely take away any power to be able to function within the framework of what God has ordained. Men would, Satan is designed to create new laws. He wants to create new laws. He wants to defy every law of God. He wants to defy the law of marriage, the consecration of husband and, and, and his wife, a man and a woman. He wants to defy the law and make a new law and say man with man and woman with woman is equal. He wants to defy every law of rulership, every law of authority. He wants to defy, defy all, every law, law of leadership. He wants to defile it all. He wants to put the woman in charge and not the man. And you can see that this is an agenda that is driven, as it were, by Hollywood, but Satan is behind it. People do not understand that all of the world, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I'm really at a transition. After we finish with Order in the House, I'm going to start ministering on the book of Revelation because people don't really understand it. The church doesn't understand it. And the world cer certainly doesn't get it around us because they just all it's all a joke. Look, bottom line of it is the whole world is going to worship Satan and know it. They're going to create an image literally of Satan and worship him. He's actually going to be here unveiled before men. He's cast out of heaven. He's cast out of the unseen realm. He becomes visible. The angel powers of angels of darkness become literally interactive with men at this period of time in Revelation chapter 13. All of the world is rushing towards that. A spirit of Antichrist is making that happen. To do that, laws have got to be changed. Every governorship, every law of God has to be reversed. In other words, Satan's going to do just the opposite. It's his agenda. Now, people don't know this. I love uh, Richard Moore's going to be with us on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Richard, not uh, some time ago, sent out a, a video clip. I believe it was a, a, a Beyonce, Beyonce or something like that, a sing, popular singer. And she, she told about what goes on with her. She says that she receives a power inside of her. She goes completely unconscious. She doesn't know what she does. She looks at it on tape, doesn't even like the person that she, that she sees describes what they actually did in the Super Bowl two years ago where they actually superimposed demon spirits, demon gods, so that everybody's hands worship, looked like it was worshiping all the people's hands up at Super Bowl. It looked like they were worshiping all these gods. What folks don't know is Satan has a very strategic assignment that he has given people and they are participating with it and we have idolized them in our culture and they are advancing an unholy agenda. Agenda. It is satanic worship completely, fully embraced by the entire world worshiping him as it were even taking his mark, taking an allegiance to him. We don't really understand that. Some people talk about it 666, but bottom line of it is that would be ground zero that's going on right now, ultimately moving the world to that place. This, is, this isn't guest prophecy. This is the word of God prophecy, moving the whole world to worship Satan, okay? Now, here we're having these events going on. Ground zero is that of those activity of people in government, in high places, in decision-making positions that affect us and the t things that we watch on television, movies, here on the radio. Uh, influencing culture, the way we act, the way we dress, the, the things we talk about, what we define as common, ordinary, normal, cool, uh, style, trendy stuff. That's ground zero, okay? Now there's a fallout. What happens, you got, the, you got the ground zero where the explosion takes place, where the big thing's going down, and then you got the fallout. 
fallout uh, where you and I are sitting here going, why am I having to deal with these thoughts? Why am I having to deal with these attitudes? Why do I feel uh, about leadership the way I feel about it? Why is it that, that I'm, I'm more kind of trending towards popular opinion and things? Well, we've got to understand that we're wrestling not against flesh and bl blood, okay? We're actually up against spiritual wickedness that is at work for the sole purpose of bringing this thing to a place that all men worship Satan. Satan believes he's going to overthrow God. He teaches men that he will overthrow God, that there are more with him than are with God, that ultimately God will have to capitulate. He teaches these kinds of things. People believe these kinds of things. That's ground zero. Fallout is you're dealing with who's the proper leadership in your home. You're dealing with the whole issue of, 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 of receiving authority and being, uh, and being respected as a man and honored as a man to live out this God-given ability, not right, divine ability by design by his law to ultimately be the person that God anoints in the house so that your whole family is blessed. God assigned it to the man, even to this day in Jewish culture. He, it's the man who teaches his family the word. By and large, it's the woman in the house that's teaching her family the word of God. I could give you an example. For example, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9 describes the man as the teacher of the word of God. Father tells us in his law, in his order, how that's supposed to go down. Bottom line of it is this. If the kids only see mama reading the Bible and teaching the Bible, they're not going to do it. Dad's the one that they're going to follow like that because God anointed it that way. It's not mom's fault. It's just the way it is. It's why it's why an object falls to the ground. It's the way it is. It's the law of life. It, it, it's the fundamental attribute and nature of what God placed within the man spiritually as much as we can distinguish the outward appearance of a man from a woman, the actions, the nature, the, 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 the mannerism of a man from a woman, just that real, there are those same spiritual dimensions. Women must be, begin to honor that and respect it and understand that it has nothing to do with competition. You're not living with your brother. You're not living with a roommate. You're not living with someone who's your competitor. You're living with a priest, a king. You're living with someone God has anointed, a prophet, to minister in his stead. It has nothing to do with intelligence. I, if you ask me, I would say that women are brighter, more beautiful, and more everything than men, okay? But praise God, it made me a man. But that, you know, <laughs> th th that's true. It's probably true. But God did not anoint the woman to do these things, to minister these things, to be the strong man of the house, to be the minister of his word, to be the priest of the home, the one who brings his family to the throne room of heaven. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, Paul says, women, don't let the women ask questions in church. Part of this is culture. This is, we're not talking about women prophesying. That is a big difference. You may all prophesy one by one, okay? In the realms of the Holy Ghost, there is neither male nor female. But what he's dealing with is he's dealing with asking a question, not prophesying. Are you with me? In verse 34, 35, he said, let the women ask their husbands at home. Guess what? The husband is the teacher. <laughs> you know, just that this is a corollary verse with first Corinthians. I mean, for, forgive me, Deuteronomy chapter six, verses one through nine. I mean, you're going to have to if you want God's blessing in your home, if it, all you got to all you and I have to do is be willing to do it God's way. And we're going to have all the things that he wants to bless us with. It's really just that simple. You want to see blessing come on your, on your house? You want to see blessing come in your home? You want to see riches and prosperity? Stop doing what you're doing and start doing what God said to do. He left nothing for discovery. He, ne he, le he left nothing for imagination. He told us exactly what to do. If we do it like he said to do it, we're going to get his results, period. Amen. Amen. Men are classic about trying in the concept of, of having this place of authority and rulership to wrestle the thing down the ground. You don't wrestle nothing down to the ground. You go to prayer with it. You take it to, to the throne room. And then if the woman wants to wrestle down things down to the ground, she's even more out of order. 
How is God ever going to bless that? How is God going to ever be in the midst of that fight? He's not going to be in the midst of that fight. He's not going to be anywhere near that strife. Huh? He's going to be calling you to come. He's going to be saying, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He's going to be calling you to come out of that mess. Submit yourself to God. You know, it's because once again, people come under the pressure. They get all stressed out. They get intimidated. Oh, they're worried. Oh, no, we're going to have to get this thing straightened out. <clears throat> Otherwise, the devil's going to take over. And then they start stepping out of the realms of their authority. Once again, the introduction that I gave you. A woman steps outside of her authority. She's a bad off. It's Saul. When he stepped outside of his authority, and he's going to, she's going to get the same results. Okay? And, and he did it because of pressure. Same way with a man. He can't step outside of his authority. He keeps his authority in God. Now, once again, he's consecrated by the Lord. He's anointed by the Lord. Now, he's responsible to remain in a position of holiness before God. And the fundamental responsibilities of a priest. Yeah, if there is any unholiness, if there's any sin, you better make your, you better get a sacrifice quickly and offer sacrifice first for your sins, then for the sins of the people. Because you come in with your sins, you're dead. <clears throat> you're going to, in other words, there's not going to be a response uh, from God that is positive. There's not going to be a, a, a reciprocation of relationship. Huh? It's over. You trespass. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. Oh. No, no other sacrifice is necessary. But at the same time, a man better make sure he's got himself put together. Otherwise, he's already abdicated. He has walked away from. He's not allowed even to function in the role of priest to the priest uh, when he is not walking in a place of holiness, not walking in a place of obedience to God. He needs, he's got to get himself right. So the whole family is not going to be blessed. The whole family is going to be under a stinking curse. Huh? Now, I do make an exception for that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, said if the unbelieving um, husband is willing to abide with the believing wife, don't let her depart. Because he says <clears throat> that the prayers uh, of that one believing spouse, because it can be the other way around too, unbelieving wife with a, with a believing husband. The prayers of that parent sanctify the children, otherwise they're unclean. Huh? Unclean means the devil can have his way with you. Huh? Clean means you consecrated, you protected. Amen. Well, what happens if you've got that because God makes a provision for a household that is unequally yoked, not by, not by the initiation of things, but unequally yoked because one got saved, you know, well after they married and here they got children. And the other still unbelieving. So the Lord said, I'm going to make a provision for you. And, but here we are. We can talk about the exemptions, okay? But, we're gonna, but more important to us <clears throat> is God's divine order because every one of us here in this room and the majority of the folks that we're addressing right now are people who are consecrated to the Lord, both, both husband and wife. And so it's got to be done according to God's divine order. Otherwise, truly, Matthew chapter 12, what is it? Verse 29 and verse 30 does apply. Because until you find a strong man, right? What is that verse of scripture? Can you see it? Yes, yeah, 12, 19. Sorry. 12, 19. 12, huh? Matthew 12, 19. Huh? 29. It is 29? Okay, did I write it down wrong then? It is that. Could I want to just get that right? Has everybody got that? I just want you to get that. Because I want you to understand, I want to get a hold of men. And women, I want you to do your best as long as you're in this tabernacle to put them in remembrance of these things. Okay? There's nothing wrong with that. Huh? There's nothing wrong with my wife coming and saying, Honey, is that what the Lord said to do? Did you, is that the way that the Lord Jesus would have done it? There's nothing wrong with this. Honey, is that the right, is that the right attitude? Is that the right perspective here on this? She's going to come and tell me because she would be wrong. She'd be wrong before she even got started. Because your attitude, the posture you're coming in, Means to whether to describe to us whether or not you come in by the Holy Ghost or you coming out of your own, your own, you know, mm -hmm. instinct, a preservation, mm -hmm. or whatever else, yeah. right? I'm gonna submit this to you, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, a godly woman is gonna treat her husband like the church is gonna treat Jesus. A godly woman is gonna treat her husband like a godly man is gonna treat Jesus. Is gonna treat a godly man is gonna treat Jesus like Jesus treats the Father. And that's what the utmost respect and honor to do, only do his will. I mean, the Christ Jesus showed us, I only live to do the will of the Father. A man in a rightly priest, in a priestly robe should be saying, I only, do to, I only live to do the will of the Lord Jesus. 
Huh? A woman should, in a rightly position, say, I only live to do the will of my husband, of what belongs to my family. That's true. That's true. That's why I put this scripture here. It scares people to death. So ought a man, so ought a man to love his wife even as his own body. What? Give me a break. No, that's the way it is. Because we're talking about Christ Jesus loving the church, which is his body. Huh? Hallelujah. And he takes care of it. And, and, and he loves, loves it as he loves himself. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Huh? And we've already laid out the response of a woman that should be there. And it's once again all in the context of that which is holy and that which is godly to say a woman takes on the identity of her husband. And take on the identity of the, of the guy down the street. Huh? She didn't take on the identity of her father. She didn't take on the identity of, of her favorite sitcom. I mean, you're going to be somebody. You're going to be somebody. You're going to have the identity of somebody. Huh? You and, and nobody purely themselves. We all a bunch of ooks look like and act like. You take what you call normal, what you believe is, is common and, and that you are, feel secure and, and, and you are and power to do. If we set you down in Angola, everybody would tell you, you are out of your mind. You can't act like that. You can't do that because they got an entirely different culture. They got an entirely different belief system. Huh? And you would, you would die, you'd conform or be dead <laughs> if you're going to live there. Because huh? there in that system, they live for the chief. They live for the chief. And the chiefs live for the king. And that's it. And you're not your own person. You're part of this, you're part of this tribe. You try to part of this bigger family. Well, you and I, we're part of a bigger family. <laughs> we're part of a, a, a much bigger, a much bigger tribe and a much bigger family. We're the household of faith. We're the household of God. I mean, God the Father is our dad. Jesus is our elder brother. I mean, come on. And we want to do what our elder brother is telling us to do. He alone knows how this works. I don't know how it works. You don't know how it works. He knows how it works. He simply says, you want to be blessed? You want to know how to do life? I'll teach you to walk in the paths of of, of righteousness. I'll lead you in the ways of life. Do what I'm telling you to do. Don't go with your culture. Don't go with what you learned in school. Don't go with your imagination. Don't go with your own discovery. Do it my way. People look at it and go, wow, that's just so crazy. How am I supposed to submit myself to my husband? Men say, how am I supposed to find time to be the minister, the pastor, the priest, the leader, how am I supposed to do all of these things? How am I supposed to be this person who cares like Jesus cares for his family, his wife and, and his children, everybody in there, protects them, uh, intercedes on their behalf, defends them, ministers to them the difference between that which is right and that which is holy, the clean and the unclean, shows them, makes it sure that everybody has a distinction between that which is pleasing to God and that which is contrary to the ways of God as a priest of Leviticus 10, 10 through 11. This is, men need to get their proper role. Yeah, it's a proper role for a man to be, as it were, that kingly position. You're going out there and you're providing and you're resourcing your family. You should, and a wife should never feel uh, like she's not being taken care of and that everything's in jeopardy and she's not safe. You know, if, if, I, if my wife at all feels, at all, I feel like she's a little bit under concern, I say, just hide behind me. Just get behind me. Just stay right here. And I'm not saying like, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> I'm saying, come here. I'll just stay right here. I'm going to protect you. You're going to be fine. But it looks total devastation. Don't worry about it. Okay. How long have you been with me? Huh? That's what Jesus did. How long have you been with me? That's what he said to his disciples. How long have you been with me? I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be fine. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes the Lord gives us real humorous ways to do it. One night my wife was just really just she was cringing over there on, uh, in the, on the passenger side. I could have ignored it. I could have not even been aware of it. But I, I'm aware of it. I care for her. I take care of her. I see she's all concerned. It's foggy. You can't see in one of those heavy marine layer nights. And, you know, you can't see 10, 20 feet in front of you. And I'm going 50, 60 miles an hour. That's the way I drive. <laughs> I feel very comfortable. I'm very protected. I know how to drive in that stuff. And far as I, you know, as far as you know, the mechanics of it and the angels of the Lord take care of the rest. And, um, you know, there is times in the past that said, you know, we've been doing this a long time now. We haven't had a wreck and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just thanking God for all the angels that, are, that go with us. And so I reached over and I grabbed the avocado and I said, here, baby, hold on this avocado. 
because I need both hands on the steering wheel right now. And it was so funny. It was so hysterical to her that all pressure was off. She laughed the rest of the way home, you know, holding the avocado. We had to take care of our wives. We've got to be sympathetic to where, where, uh, what their needs are. I can't just ignore an ins uh, something where she's got a need. She feels insecure. There's things that's not being met in her life. It's my responsibility to make sure every one of her needs are fully met. It's my responsibility. Huh? And if she's got to remind me, that's okay. But she shouldn't have to remind me if I'm going to be willing to grow up, mature, and, and, and be that one who loves my wife as my own body. If I'm going to be that person who's really caring for her as I would care for myself. I'm, and then ultimately take it to another level because the Lord Jesus became our servant. So meeting our needs, so resourcing us, so taking care of us. You know, when it comes to the ministry of the whole household, I love Job 1.5. This is the role of a man seen. Here is a man to model in the Old Testament. A man that the Lord says is perfect and upright in all of his ways. In other words, the Father said, this is the man that I created. This is what I'm looking for. Look to him. His, look at what he did. And, and, and you can see how he makes intercession, how he's praying, how he's taking the personal responsibility not to go tell his kids you need to get on your knees and pray, not to go tell his wife you need to pray. And when are you guys doing your Bible study? Look at what he does. He goes and he gathers up a, a, every offering and every sacrifice that needs to be made and he goes offers sacrifice and offerings for his children so that his, every a part of his kid's life and his, his family's life, his wife, children, all down. Everybody's taken care of. There's no unrepented sin. He's being the priest. He's being the intercessor. He's taking them before God. He's covering them. He's making that petition for them so that they are 100% acceptable. That's what Jesus is doing. He ever lives to make intercession for us. He's making sure that we're well taken care of, that the sin, that if there's weaknesses or if there's problems or if there's, if there's wrongdoing or if there's sin, it's cleansed, it's washed away. We correct it. We get instructed on what we're supposed to do differently. He leads the way from a spiritual sacrifice of intercession, not telling us what we got to do. Huh? It's a big difference. Do we got to have one part before the next part before the next part? But if you do not have a woman in the house who's going to be willing to obey God, none of this even works. That's why Paul opens up Ephesians chapter 5 as he does and makes it emphatic. Women, you got to submit to the authority. This is really what he's saying. Women, you got to submit to the authority that I've anointed to execute my blessings in your life. <laughs> and, and, and it's hard to hear it that way because it's just this man thing, you know. It's, you know, what, i got to submit to him, you know. Yeah, but it's, it's, like, it's like the church say, you got to kid me. you kidding me. i got to submit to him and pointing to Jesus. Hello. Well, my husband's not Jesus. Yeah, because you won't let him be. You won't let him be. you got to empower him to be. Huh? Well, he's just a rascal. He's messed everything up. Well, I'll tell you what. If you weren't such a rascal yourself, you would have noticed. Okay? You would rather be down loving him on your face, praying and interceding, waiting till God, so that, waiting on God so that Father can do his work. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus and raise him up. Because you start praying and interceding, woman starts praying and interceding, things are going to be better. Now, listen. I, I don't even want to have to talk about that because there's too many, there's too many proper relationships that already exist. Good women of God, holy women of God that are sitting in houses right now, in homes here, relationships right now. Everybody wants it to be godly. So let's just get on with the program. Let everybody understand what they got to do. Women, you got the easy job. True. You get to sit, kick back and ride, on, ride around in style you know, living on the luxury and the, and the hard labors and the sacrifices and the commitments of your husband and enjoy and don't feel guilty. Because that's the way the Lord set it up. Amen. That's a good job. Has anybody got a problem with that? God's going to endow you. It's better than being born, it's better than being born wealthy, you know. It's better than having, you know, trillions of dollars in the bank account. The Lord's fully resourced you. Hallelujah. Just stand around and worship Him. Give thanks. Because the, the responsibility for the family, and I went into a lot of this, is what I focused on last 
time we had a meeting, the responsibility of the family falls upon the man's head for good or for bad. And then that goes down to his whole family for good or for bad, beginning with Adam. And I'm not going to cover all, of, you know, go back over all of those details again, but you understand where I'm coming from. It's responsibility for the, it's responsibility for the husband to bring peace in the home, not the wife. Okay? I do believe that a woman holds a key to their, how, the home being happy. You know, I counsel all men, don't marry a woman who's unhappy. You're going to have a miserable life. If you think she's happy, spend a long time watching her, making sure it's real happiness. Because it's terrible living with a woman that's sad, and I've said all the time, just disappointed. Because you can't ever satisfy her. It's just, my goodness, no matter what you do, you can't satisfy her, just unhappy. Because unhappy state is a spiritual state. And so if you, you, whatever you're unhappy about now, if I fix it as your husband, okay, give, give it, you're going to find something else to be unhappy about. And just going to be on unhappy, unhappiness to the next. And then after we get you all the world and the universe, you're still unhappy. Because you don't have what fills your spiritual state. Man, woman, women need to be happy. Men, you are responsible for bringing that joy. Okay, so you say, I got, a, I got a wife, she's unhappy, she's sad, she's murmuring, she's complaining. The Lord had a wife like that too. Israel. She's unhappy, she was sad, she didn't want him to be around, uh, she's murmuring, she's complaining. Look at what he did. He worked with her and he worked with her and finally gave a divorce. But he worked with her for a long time. Huh? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the right kind of relationship, aren't we? And, and reality of it is, the beginning of our whole intercession and ministry to our wives is that we're not going to tell them you've got to be happy. We're going to supply happy for them, like God the Holy Ghost supplies happy to us, like Jesus supplies happy to us. He supplies peace. His reign is peace and, 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 and love. And th that has to be there, and it's got to be there fundamentally, not because we're just showing it out of a human condition, out of a good, you know, sense of nature and demeanor, but we are really touching heaven and having that supply of the Spirit flowing through us to our wives, to our children, to where the home truly is a sanctuary in which a man is standing there looking like God and representing God to his wife and to his children both in spirit and in word and, and in deed. Hallelujah. What a happy home. Praise God. Man, a man needs to be given to the things of the spirit if he's going to have this. And, and women, you can be, that, that don't have, I mean, I get emails all the time and people are watching right now, many different places throughout the United States of America, places I never even imagined. And they get emails all the time. Look, my husband's an unbeliever. My husband's constantly, he, one day he's Christian, the next day he's, a backslider. My kids are seeing this inconsistency. What do I do? I'm telling you, there's a grace. There's a grace. God will protect your children. Don't get into a struggle with your, with your husband. Go after the thing in the spirit. He, watch what the Lord will do. The Lord will change them. The Lord will protect your children. You live, as a, you live the model of relationship in every way as a wife should be living walking in faith and maybe in certain situations calling those things which are not as though they were seeing your husband in the eternal purposes of God and the plan of God living it out in a faith realm and watch how father take up you know the slack he'll make up for the rest he'll come and he'll do everything that he's possible to do to bring change in your husband's in your husband's life it's true and so you know this is something people are going to have to grasp and then of course you don't you don't go outside the boundary of the Lord. If, you're, if your husband wants you to do some unholy thing, and there's, and there's actually churches I know saying such crazy things that husbands and wives can do together. If you know your husband's asking you to do something that's clearly sin and un un ungodliness, you don't do that. You don't submit to that at all. But in every other way, you know, you, you submit to your husband, you love him, you, you see him in the fraternal purposes of God. You empower him to be, you know, the man that you're believing God for him to be and the man that Father's purposed him to be. Amen. Amen. And, you know, this, this last one, vision, casting vision. 
is something I, I, I believe that is absolutely important as a continual ongoing thing. And of course, if you was in first order, first series in the order in the house, you know, I spent quite a bit on vision where you're, you're, you're helping everyone to understand where we're all going here. So it's not just ministering the word, it's ministering what we're doing as a family, where we're going as a family. Without a vision, the people perish, family perish. Here's who we are. Here's what God has called us to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's why we do it together. And, and it, it doesn't have to be a thing that you force. When, when the love is there, when the joy is there, when the peace is there, when the right role model is there, when the right consecration is there, when the right commitment, I'm leading my kids in worship. I'm not just leading my kids in worship at this church. I'm leading my kids in worship at home. Huh? And I'm not, and, I, and I'm not a taskmaster about it. Right? You just give them a, you know, I remember when they were real little, little guys and they couldn't sit still for nothing. They're up and down, back and forth and here and there. Just give them a little rattler to say, shake. You know? Give them something to shake. Little tambourine. We're going to sing now. Okay? And, and they don't really know anything to do but just, you know, beat one another over the head with the rattler. That's okay. It's okay. We get in the process. We're engaged here. Huh? I'm not going to look at all of that. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now, you know, as long as they're a child, they can be a child. Then there's a proper time when they better put you away childish things. Now, we begin to deal with them differently. Husbands, fathers, priests, leaders of the home need to know how to properly deal with their kids. And it's not just you just deal with them wide open the same way. You deal with them when they're 13 years old, same way you deal with, dealt with them when they were six months old. Well, that's ludicrous, man. What happened to that, you know, what happened to that space of 12 and a half years between when they were six months old and now they're 13? You need to be mentoring them. You need to be right there with them. Um, casting vision, having, being the leader uh, demands that we understand the things that need to be fixed within the framework of our house that many times is just, let's just get in the car and go somewhere. Let, I, I, let me just spend some time alone with you, okay? We need to spend some alone time. I need to take one of the children. We just need to go out and spend some time, just love on them. When we were, uh, when my kids were growing up, uh, we, didn't have, we didn't have money to go on vacations, but we didn't have, we, we, could, we could not afford to go on vacations, but we could not afford not to go on vacations. Okay, because I understood something very fundamental about bonding, about getting along, getting out of all the other distractions and all the other pressures and all the issues, other issues, getting in the car and driving somewhere for eight hours with everybody. <laughs> Feeling all the issues and going through all the transitions because you really get to know them and, it, you know, and one of my things was meditate. After a while, it was just time to meditate. We're meditating now, okay? <laughs> and uh, we're going on a fishing trip. So what do you do? How much does a tent cost? It costs like about 60, 70 bucks for a basic tent. Okay, save up for it. How much does a campfire cost? It's free, the matches, okay? <laughs> and how much does the food cost? Less than what it cost at ha the house, right? Because it's, you know, it's just doing it real simple. But the result of it. And then, of course, as they got older, we made it more and more fun. Why? I want my kids to see I'm investing in them. I'm empowering them. I love them. I mean, I want to make sure that my wife knows I'm investing in her. I forgot Valentine's one time in my life. I will never forget it <laughs> again. I didn't really forget it. I was just really late that <laughs> evening. And that is wrong. Not Valentine's. Birthday, maybe. Valentine's, no way. <laughs> And, you know, it's, it's, it's the responsibility of a man to do what a man is supposed to do with respect for caring for the needs of his wife, understanding what is important to her. You know, what, what really is valuable to her? What, what makes her happy? Do you notice when she's feeling a little bit overwhelmed, overworked? Can you see it on her face? Do you immediately rush to go and help her to relieve some of that pressure? Because that's your responsibility, leader, priest, king, prophet. Are you with me? Huh? It is. And if you don't do it, that's wrong. God help us. It takes guys three times as long to grow up as a woman. 
for Jesus. That's why men are supposed to marry younger women because maybe it kind of balances things out a little bit on the maturity level. Of course, so they say. I don't think so. I think there's still a great differential. The beautiful thing of it is, is God's anointed the man, okay? The, the women, men can use a little bit of coaching, okay, right? There's the executive coach is permissible. If you want to learn about the executive coach, go back to the first series in order to the house. You know, we laid out the real easy stuff, the real palatable stuff. We laid out, you know, the things that seem to be more in, from, a, from a humanistic view, equitable, but still strong in leadership, right? So casting vision for your, for your whole family isn't just about talking about it. It's going investing in them and saying, here's where we're going to go. I mean, I wanted my kids, I never let my kids ever hear, we can't afford it. It doesn't exist. It's not even a vocabulary, okay? Well, we'll come up with some other alternative word if we're not buying it, not afford it. Can't afford it, doesn't exist. We faith people, man. We need it, it's ours. What do we need? Well, Ruthiana, she must have been about five years old. And we were going by this mountain. mountain. And I said, uh, wow, I said, that's a beautiful mountain. You could do a ski resort there. And Ruthiana said, we just might as well go ahead and buy it and do it. I didn't say anything about it because she's got, she's got no, no limits, no bounds. No limits, no bounds. I wanted to be able to fully, freely, with great liberty and empowerment, go do whatever she feels is the right thing to do in God. Whatever her heart goes, not feel like, oh, I can't do it because I'm stupid. There's certain words that have ever come out of a man's mouth towards a woman. I mean, that's bad. There's a, there's a certain program that we have for that, but I'm not, it's an unmentionable program right now. It's a certain type of contest, but we're not going to talk about the contest. It has something to do with going way out in the ocean, but I'm going to leave it there, okay? I'm not going to go into it and like blood and sharks and stuff, but nonetheless. Yeah. And Mindy, you know, you, you're supposed to speak life, the words of life. If there's anything that the Lord Jesus is modeling for us is these words of life, these words of encouragement, these words of comfort, these words of you can do it, these words of faith, these words of empowerment. Every, I never heard Jesus. Yes. Is there words of correction? Yes. It's always come back over here. But more than the words of correction, there's the words of empowerment. You can do this. I've empowered you to do this. And you know, and if I really started going into this tonight, I don't have a lot of time. What time is it? People texting and doing all kinds of stuff. Seven minutes to eight. I'm like running out of time. But the reality of it is women have a priestly role in the house. Women have a prophetic role in the house. Women have, a, in some respects, a, a, you might could say a kingly role in the house. But that's where it gets a little, it's a little bit harder to, to, to communicate that. But truly on priestly, prophet, pastor, mentor, teacher. But she can never come into her rightful place until she submitted to her husband's rightful place any more than a man can come into his rightful place until he submitted to uh, the Lord Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah. So the blame game does not allow. No one's blamed. You blaming anybody? Jesus blaming you? That's you. I'm blaming you. No. Blaming is a synonym for accusing, condemning. He's not blaming. Huh? Words of correction are not blame. They're, this is what you're doing that's wrong. We need to do this. It's the priestly role of saying, this is wrong. This is unholy. We need to do this which is right. Okay? I'm telling you, a priestly role in love making, in showing love and making sure that a woman is fully taken care of in every way, absolutely essential. Man is supposed to care for the needs of his wife. Because now, when you know, talk here in this verse of Scripture that a man is supposed to love his wife as his own body. But you can then go look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and you can discover that a woman hath not power over her body but the man. And a man hath not power over his body but the woman. And that the Lord is so emphasizes the love making that he says, you're not even allowed to fast and pray unless you agree together to do it if you can separate yourself from each other, huh? Because it's such an important part of the nurturing of that, 
of, of, of love and, and the meeting of those needs and, and the proper care and interaction, the proper knitting together and intimacy. I mean, intimacy with the Lord is obviously completely different, but nonetheless, it's deeply intimate. Huh? And, you, and as you mature, it becomes more and more intimate. I, there's nothing more fulfilling, nothing more satisfying, nothing more wonderful than just being overwhelmed by the presence of the Lord. I, I live in a constant state of the manifest presence. Now, there are times where I am specifically doing things that Father wants me to do, many times, not to my convenience, and not what I really want to do, because I think maybe somebody needs to be corrected or whatever. You know, my own thinking. And I'll rather, because I know the difference between my own thinking and what the Holy Ghost has to say. And I defer to the Holy Ghost. And when I do that, Father blesses me with an amazing manifest glory and an anointing that my body will feel the effect of for hours, sometimes days. That's wonderful, that kind of intimacy with the Lord. And it's just doing what I'm supposed to do, being what I'm supposed to be, not going with my own ideas, not going with deferring to my own interest, but doing it Father's way, representing Him. It really always comes down to this. Are you going to represent me or are you going to represent you? And I'm like, I'm thinking. Used to I think too hard about it. I'm thinking, Lord, you need me to kick in here. You know, we don't say that. You know, but that's really where we are going with it. No, I, we learn, we grow uh, into this place of, I am going to re represent the Lord, and I'm not going to represent myself. That's my interaction with my wife. Oh, we get to the house, we've got to let our hair down, got to relax, be ourselves sometime. Well, what is it for you to be yourself, mm -hmm. by the way? <laughs> what does that look like when you let your hair down and relax? <laughs> I mean, that should be the nature of who you are. Amen. And the nature of who you are should defi be defined by the divine nature. Huh? I'm not under some kind of pressure to represent God. Do I look like I'm under some kind of a pressure right now? Do I look like I'm like, you know, stressed out, right? And worried about what everybody's thinking. What am I going to think? What am I going to say in the next sentence? Oh, no, you know, oh, no, I've lost my notes. What am I going to do now? No, I'm relaxed. I'm enjoying the process. This is the relationship. I'm living in the relationship. I'm ministering out of the relationship. I'm functioning out of the relationship. This is the way it's supposed to be. A, a man in his, in his house and the woman of the house and the man responding to his spouse. And, and the spouse and the wife responding to her spouse. The man responding to his sister. The woman responding to her brother. Sisters and brothers in Christ. Huh? The man being so caring for his best friend. My best friend. I, I, it, really, it really just gets me deep. When I hear a man or a woman talking that their best friend is somebody other than their spouse. I'm like... Ugh, can I say something now, Lord? <laughs> I mean, it really, it grinds me. It's like, that is so totally out of order. That is such an offense. That is such a slap in the face, whether the person realizes it or not. It's so deeply hurtful. Your best friend is your husband. Your best friend is your wife. If they're not, you got a problem. You got the problem, not them, you. Okay, it's not your brother, not your sister, but it's you, right? Your friend. You, 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 sister, your brother, your spouse. Papa put the most wonderful dimensions of his relationship, of who he is and how he has a relationship with us in the context of the marriage. This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and his church. I speak to Christ and to the church. This intimacy. You're not going to learn it outside of this. You're going to really learn the things that Christ Jesus is to you as, you're, as you are them to your wife. And your wife is going to receive the blessings and, and the security and the comfort that only can come by way of such a representation in her life. It won't if that representation is in her life, it will never exist. She'll never really know what it meant to be married. To never know what it meant to have a husband. 
to her. All of her needs are met in her husband. I mean, obviously, once again, that's all connected with spiritual because it's all connected with loving Jesus first. Um, if a person took that out of the context of their individual relationship, because I'm talking about the relationship with the husband and the relationship with the wife, with the Lord first, then it would be wrong. Because then a husband would try to get something out of his wife that she can't give, ugh, and the wife would try to get something out of her husband that he can't give. And that would be frustrating and unsatisfying. And my, many people live there in that. We get what we need from the Lord first. Reality of it is like this. Husband, if you're walking in oneness with the Lord Jesus, and your wife is walking in oneness with the Lord Jesus, then you got oneness. It's just really, it's truly the way it is, spiritually. The Lord took it to another level, and I don't really believe that you can take it and isolate it outside of that spiritual dimension. But what the Lord joins together, he makes them one. He makes them one flesh. Then I understand it even going even to another degree when Paul said if a man, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if a man is joined unto a, a, a prostitute, which is usually a one-night stand, they one flesh. God made a spiritual law there of oneness, of people coming to uh, this oneness of this of the spiritual dimension that gets all frustrated and gets all messed up and can never be right outside the context of that which is holy. But, but there's still something going on. There's a spiritual dimension. A lot of people are burdened with it, overwhelmed by it, bogged down by it. That Those things have to be dealt with properly. Spiritually, spiritually they are stuck by unrepented sin wrong relationships in their past. The good thing about it is, is the blood of Jesus Christ quickly erases all of that and makes it real easy to get past it. All you have to do is look at the sin, confess your sin, amen, and the Lord Jesus removes all the effects of it. It's beautiful, isn't it? That's what he does for us. Let me see if, if I left anything out here. Once again, I, this, is really, this is really worth underscoring. And Hebrews chapter 3, verses 1 through, I, I put just verses 1 through 2, but it actually goes further than that. It's faithfully building the spiritual structure of our house. And it's staying with, it's staying with it. It's something that we do every day. If you have a goal, if you have a dream, if you have a vision, something that you want to accomplish, you have to do something every day towards that goal, that dream, that vision. If you do not, it's a fantasy. There's nothing about fantasy in the scripture. There's no good thing about fantasizing, okay? The Lord wants us to have a dream. He wants to have a goal. He wants a vision. Here we have the Lord working to build a spiritual house to where everything is in its proper place. I mean, I'm, I've got my heart just deeply involved in my kids all being full of the Holy Ghost when they're little guys. And it never stopped. It was every day. I want to do this right. And I didn't do everything right. Because, you know, there were times where I put them in intense pressure when they were too young. And I took them out to do work that was too difficult, to handle horses that were too wild. To, I put pressures on them that I should have not put pressures on them. I should have been more gentle. I should have been more wise about, wait a minute, let's, let's, let's build up to this. But I just threw them right in the big heavy of it. And, you know, praise God for his mercy when we make mistakes. He helps us to regroup. Fortunately, it didn't take me a year to catch on. You know, it's like, hello, you know, I'm not supposed to be doing this. Lord, forgive me. Okay, now how can I make this up to my kids? Okay, we're really quick to scold our children about wrongdoing. Well, we need to be quicker about praising them for right doing. We're very quick to give them punishments for the things that they sh 
didn't do correctly, we need to be more quickly to give them rewards for the things that they did right. I'm looking right at somebody says, well, I can't afford it. Well, who do you serve? What do you mean can't afford it? Can't af what are you talking about? Can't afford it. You need to think about how you bless your kids. Um, we didn't have, we in, in cl come close to having finances to do this. But I went, I went to go get my, I went to go get my uh, son a car. Because it's, he's now, he's faithfully done so many things. He's worked with me. He's been just a blessing. I'm going to go to get him a car. And I'm going to get him a used car. And the Lord said, I didn't give you nothing used. And I walked away from the used car thinking, well, how am I going to do this? I mean, financially, there's no way I can do this. You know, think, think, think. Don't think too long. Lord, you didn't give me any, anything. Now, Lord, it's going to be a miracle if I go over here and try to get this car for him. And they give me a loan to do it. But that's the only way I know how to do it. Right at this minute, because I'm going to get the thing right now. Now, Lord, where's the money? I'm looking around. Maybe I missed the goal laying on the <laughs> ground. Huh? But I can move in faith. I can move in faith no matter what. Was it a sacrifice? Was, did we didn't even know where it was coming from. I mean, you know, if you would have asked Ann about it, she's like, there's not money for groceries and you're going to go buy a new car for it. But she's a good girl. Huh? She's, she's a good girl. Whatever I say, she said, okay, I'm going to be, I'm, she's behind it. It doesn't matter if it's all whacked out. There's not enough money for food. You're going to go like, car. I mean, there's enough money for food. You know what I'm saying? It could be better. Not enough money for clothes. Could be better. You know, we're, Father's taking care of us, right? You could reduce it to that. But the beautiful thing is she's supporting the vision. Whatever the Lord tells you to do, I'm with you. It doesn't fit in the budget, but let's do it. Huh? So when I got a truck, nothing down. Trove off the lot, you know, with it. Brought it to him. There it is. Well, unbeknownst to me, I wasn't thinking very well. I set precedence now. Can I get my second son, Daniel? Can I get him a used car? You got Josh a new car. Okay. You know, my, I, my, mother, said, I did, my mother said after I had, um, done, had, had done the deed, she said, did you really think through that? <laughs> she said, you know, she's highlighting the fact of now you have set precedence. And there's absolutely no way that you can give a lesser gift next year and it still be valued. It's going to have to be equal or better. Are you with me? When you go shopping, you better hear from the Lord. I said, Mama heard from the Lord. That's what the Lord said to you. And then the Lord did the same thing, or did the same thing, or did the same thing. We just this month paid off. Ruth Ann, our fourth child, car, every one of them, by faith, miraculously, because my heart was there. My heart, it's not something I had a last minute thing. My heart's been there since they were little. Lord, how do I empower them? How do I give them a strong sense of identity? How do I make leaders out of them? How do I show them your blessing? How do I impart faith into them? How do I impart strength into them? I'm building a spiritual house. Jesus built a spiritual house. Let me close reading that verse of scripture. Did anybody bring me a Bible that I could read? It's not in Spanish and doesn't have uh, number four font. <laughs> anybody have a Bible that's got like at least six font? <laughs> Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hey, I hope that you guys have been getting something out of this, okay? Yes. And, you know, I'm really feeling... I'm really feeling the wind down of order in the house too. And I'm going to leave it open for people to send me via email suggestions for anything else you want, any other topics you want changed. But I'm feeling the wind down of it and just wait for order in the house three, go deeper. Because what we want is we want to be able to take it layer upon layer, right? Always going deeper, broader, higher. I've really been feeling the strong... Um, compulsion to doing study in the book of Revelation, to study on last day's prophecy. Because the things that are going on that I'm hearing just simply are not sound Bible teaching. Just not sound Bible teaching.
to say that we're in the sixth trumpet is so ludicrous. It's just not sound Bible teaching to create scenarios in the future that, are, that is not what the Bible describes, that it's not sound Bible teaching. And so when we are stirred by that, those kinds of things, then we have a responsibility before the Lord to step up and make sure that we're making up the difference, which we can only do by His help and His grace, obviously. I can't, I have no ability to be a father. I learned that right, I understood that right off. I, I went to my, my dad, I went to some other leaders, and I said, why, why did the Lord design for us to be fa you know, for fathers at such a young age when we don't know what we're doing? <laughs> and one guy said, because when you're old enough to know what you're doing, you're too worn out. <laughs> I heard different, different things. <laughs> Here's what I believe. Father wants us to learn total dependency on him to do it. He, we can do it best when we don't know how to do it. If we'll trust him, then we're totally relying upon him to do it. And then it works if I'm totally, no, no pressure, man. I'm good to go here. We can make the, we can do this because father's given us power. I don't have to come up with this. I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to analyze nothing. All I got to do is get down on my face and pray for my kids. Walk around praying for them. As long as I could hold them, I, I, my prayer time was walking around with my kids. Okay? Even when they were like slung up on my shoulder. And there's no bonding like that. There's no attachment. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart. It doesn't say may not depart. I mean, and training up a child is Deuteronomy chapter 6, ministering the word of God to them. Training up a child is modeling the ministry of Jesus, taking good care of that child's mama, laying your life down for that child's mama, making sure, you know, that I, when I got my wife, our wedding ring, I, mean, I couldn't afford nothing. I'm telling you, I was a, just a starving student on the third floor of the science building, living in a sleeping black bag in the organic chemistry room between there and the chromatograph room running the gas chromatography in NMR. And the teachers knew it and they were fine with it. And I hadn't stepped into the realm of faith for provision yet. And you had to have, like, you'd have to have a high-powered microscope to see the diamond in that ring I got her. <laughs> she was gracious enough to act like it was a, a, a big ring, you know, that it was really something, it was terrible, man. And I got that thing for like 200 bucks and paid payments <laughs> of $30. Uh, every, uh, I thought it was like $30 a month. And that was everything I was making as being, uh, you know, TA in for, for, for nursing students, chemistry class. It was everything. They gave me 30 bucks a month. But in my heart, I was set. There will be a day that I'll be able to step out and do something. And I was like, it wasn't ever like, oh, that's good enough. You just have to do whatever. And she never put a pressure on me. She never asked me for nothing. She, she acted like, oh, wow, this is beautiful. It's not that I'm gracious. <laughs> like I said, you have to have a high powered microscope to be able to see the diamond. It's like, ah, this, ah. She, she's all excited about it. Hey, that's the right kind of woman to marry. And then the Lord, we just built a spiritual house. We were faithful to build a spiritual house. It was all about that, it wasn't about material things at all. And my wife was raised. I mean, I went to her father and I said, you know, Ann's going to be fine with me, I'm sure, because she's not materially minded. He started laughing. She's not materially minded because she's had everything she's ever needed. She's born with a silver spoon in her mouth. Here in La Jolla overlooking the ocean. You know, give me a break. What are you talking about? She's not materially minded. She never had to be. She's had everything. Well, a beautiful thing of it is that she is willing to go with me and have nothing. Except for what she had in her bank account because she had money in her bank account. And then the Lord added to that was surprise money because she only thought she had 200 bucks and ended up having 450 bucks. We were set. <laughs> she had a car. I had a guitar. <laughs> and off we went. Wow. Huh? And I didn't feel intimidated. <laughs> I felt like the man of the house. Praise God. <laughs> the priest of the home. Anointed of the Lord. Watch what we're going to do now because we're going to go conquer the world for Jesus. Amen. And praise 
the Lord, I had a wife who believed in me because she loved me. She's believed in me. She believed in the Lord. She believed in the call and vision of my life. She'd been in the church for three years anyways. So why don't you just, she didn't just met this, meet this guy, came in out of the surf, his hair all matted up, saying, do you want to marry me? So although my hair was, in that, those days, lots of times, matted up with salt, and because I was just coming out of the surf. <laughs> she saw beyond all of that. She, 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 she was able to see beyond all my, Faults and sin. Huh? That's, love is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Can you do without love? No one can do without love. Nothing on the, on the planet can do without love. Nothing. And Father said, come here, I'm going to show you. Come here, come on here. You think you know about love? Come here, I'm going to show you about it. Let me show you what this looks like. Now, here's, you like it? Is it beautiful? Isn't this wonderful? Yes. Would you like to participate? Absolutely. Do these things. Oh, Really? That? Just do that. Watch what happens. He's the master of life. He's the master house builder. We have to be dedicated to building a spiritual house with the same kind of devotion, long-suffering, patience, mercy, forgiveness, tenderness, gentleness, purpose, vision, caring. I mean, just goes all those words. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise the name of Jesus. Once again, you know, I, I, you know, I know women right now are listening via the web and you're saying, my husband's not that, I wish my husband was that. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, start at the beginning. Start at the beginning. Empower him. Look beyond his faults and sins. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Father did for us. He loved us. Even when we were all messed up, he loved us. He spoke faith into our life. He prophesied over there's something great to have when you start prophesying over your husband or prophesying over your wife. Either way, however it goes. And, um, you know, I just feel for so many women I, because it is amazing to me how many women do not have godly husbands in their home who love the Lord diligently and their husbands just are not godly men. They do, they've not been taught how to be men. And then they've not been taught how to be men of God. And then they've not been taught how to be priests. And Lord, help us to do a better job of it. Help us to make sure that everybody understands that priestly ministry role that, uh, that Father has. It's Dad, you the one supposed to be teaching your family the Word of God, the things of the Spirit showing them how to flow in the gifts of the Spirit, devoted to building a spiritual house. First Corinthians, rather Hebrews, rather. Isn't that where I want to be? <coughs> Hebrews chapter 3. Wherefore, therefore, breath, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Boy, this is really bringing us in, okay? It's telling us who we are. It's putting us our, in our position for our divine purpose, where we're ruling and reigning throughout the ages to come, seated together with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realm. That's the introduction, pulling us into our responsibility. Cons consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Planting this ministry, that apostolic ministry, taking and seeing the things of God established in a place that they never were established before, and that's your home. That's your family. God's bringing in these eternal souls, seeing them raised up with the same kind of passion that Mrs. Wesley, Mr. and Mrs. Wesley had to see their boys raised up to change the earth. My grandmother prayed. Her father was a, a Quaker preacher, and she prayed earnestly for the Lord to give her one son that was an evangelist that would bring souls into the kingdom. And, and, and my dad, my dad had a, a appearing, an angel appeared to him when he was 12 years old. And why? Mama was there participating with Papa, who were there building a spiritual house, taking not an earthly position about their earthly interest and the earthly purpose and the earthly value of their children, but their heavenly one, their eternal one, bringing us into that, 
that perspective of things. Because I'm telling you right now, the word of God ministered in the home is more important than food on the table. Mm -hmm. We want to give our kids all these wonderful things, but if they don't have the riches of the Spirit first, all those wonderful things will ruin them. Yeah. It'll destroy them. And the Lord allowed me to get things for my children, empower me to get things for my children because of the riches of heaven that was established in their life. Because this is the law. Prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Yeah. So prosperity has to lead the way. Yeah. I am the priest. Christ Jesus is the priest. He is responsible and has, been, and has been faithful to bring soul prosperity in my life. As a priest following my master, I'm responsible to bring soul prosperity and minister the anointing by the laying on of hands, to lay my hands on my wife and bless her and pray for her. And to bless her, I bless and praise my wife every day. She, she deserves to be honored. She deserves to be esteemed and to be praised. And the Lord wants it that way, and I do that. And I rallied my children to come and praise their mother for who she is and what she does for us. Because she's the Proverbs 30 wonderful woman. <laughs> and we remind her of that all the time. We thank her. I think I mean, my wife has never brought me food ever, uh, fixed something for me ever that I didn't say, thank you, baby. This is so wonderful. Except for like the first couple of times when we were still, we weren't married. And it's like, what is this? You're trying to poison me. <laughs> this is nuts. This tastes terrible. Didn't anyone train you how to cook? But I was an idiot then. That was before. That was before I was married and received the anointing to know how to properly do things. And so my wife, once again, she didn't have to do the cooking and whatnot. And so I was good at cooking. And so I went in there and I taught her everything I know. <laughs> and now I can't eat my own food because she cooks so much better and has been that way for a long time. But nonetheless, I mean, we want, we, we're going to honor the Lord. We're going to thank the Lord. Thank you, Father, for this food. But wait a minute. He, he, wants me, he wants me to take care of his daughter. He wants me to thank her. He wants me to show the value and the appreciation. Look at what Jesus does for us. Look at how he honors us. He honors us with the anointing when we don't deserve it. The value, the appreciation that he shows us, the empowerment that he gives us, the riches that he bestows upon us, the graces, which are far more than all the gifts that I could ever get for my wife. Oh, come on, man. I should be getting, like, special offerings from all the women. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos for the best sermon they ever heard preached. I know I'm getting it from my wife right now. <laughs> Who was faithful to him that appointed him? I've got to be, I want to be faithful to my Lord who appointed me as Jesus was faithful to his Lord and God that appointed him to build a spiritual house that he's built a place that spiritual sacrifice would be continually offered up. That's, that's what he's built. That's what he's devoted to building. I must be willing to be the priest following my master in the same way. That's the call that we read here and been studying in Ephesians chapter 5. Who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. And look at how Moses was faithful in all of his house. Now I know. I know what happened. I know how hard it is to be a pastor. I know Moses ultimately said, look, I'm done with this. <laughs> must, I, must I fetch rock for you rebels? It's always a witness to all of us. Don't get impatient. Don't get impatient. Glorify Father. It doesn't matter. Moses lost out on, on the more that he could have had. Okay? It's easy to get that way from a pastoral point of view in a church. No? See, Moses saw the picture. He saw the heavenly picture. He saw the heavenly pattern. He knew how glorious it was. He knew how wonderful it was. He was like going, looking at the people going, you got to be kidding me, man. You guys don't want this? And then he mentors him. He works with him faithfully for 40 years. Bless his heart. Pastors, as a father, pastoring. Number one, your wife pastoring your children, doing it faithfully, doing it as, as the Lord pastors us, learning to be more gentle, be more caring, more considerate, 
more affectionate. And like I said, women also have a pastoral role in the house as well. But, uh, and, and that just ultimately naturally develops in this whole context. But everything has to be in its proper order for it to work. If it's not, if, my, if, if the woman tries to be the priest, she tries to be the Bible reader, the teacher of the spiritual things, the one who does all of the praying, does all the teaching, does all the singing, does... It just doesn't work. You've got to empower women. Women, take the Bible in your hand. When your husband walks in the door, don't meet him with a Bible. Meet him with kisses. <laughs> Hugs. Tell him how much you love him. Show a whole bunch of affection. As long as women are showing the affection that they need to be showing their husband, the husband won't be looking elsewhere. I'm sure of it. Yeah, you, I hope you can hear that. I'm kind of wrapping up now. And once you're done with that, get the Bible, walk over, put it in his hands, and say, read to us. Mentor that way. And, and, if he, and if he just throws the Bible down and says he's too tired, just be gracious about it. Be loving about it. Just have him to understand your need and the children's need to hear from him what God's saying. And just leave it there. Don't, if, you, if you talk more, you're going to ruin it. <laughs> you totally ruin it. But if you just leave it there, the Lord will take that and he'll burn that into the spirit of that man. I'm telling you right now. Those words will echo through his mind and his heart <laughs> and he'll begin to understand how he's robbing his family of the most important provision that he has been empowered to give. Spiritual provision to the house. Amen. Amen. Love all of you. I'm so blessed that you come that I'm not here talking to two or three people and everybody else on the web. It may really helps to have your live appearance and faces here and not have to interact with you virtually. If you have, if you have other topics that you want, really would like to have us discuss, minister on before we stop order in the house, then I'm going to give you a week to do that. Get those topics to me. I'll look at all of the topics and see whether or not I just want to add answer a bunch of questions so the to it could be a topic it could just be a question and I might just go down the list of questions we'll keep it totally anonymous no one will know who asked the question and um, then at most plan for one more order in the house in this series okay so I'm expecting to get questions and or topics and then we'll just bring all of those together next time and I know that the Lord will take those things which you've heard and are willing to do and he will empower you to do them. And between the Holy Ghost and your wife, you'd be continually stirred up by being put in remembrance of these things. Amen. To do them. To be the priest of the home. Prophet of the home. Minister of the home. Pastor of the home. Teacher. Did I say king? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed is the name of the Lord. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ Jesus loves the church. Wives, submit yourself to your husbands, just like the church submits to the Lord Jesus. It's a wonderful, wonderful relationship. Husbands, men, love your wives as your own body. Women, see that you reverence your husband. And it's all in the context of this relationship between Christ Jesus and the church. And there's a great reward in it because you get to discover something about love that otherwise is impossible for you to ever really, truly know. I believe the Lord has confined it there. Thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen.